Chapter Twelve of the Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Red and the Black, Volume One by Stendhal, translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Twelve: A Journey. Elegant people are to be found in Paris. People of character may exist in the provinces. CIA. At five o'clock the following day, before Madame de Renal was visible, Julien obtained a three days' holiday from her husband. Contrary to his expectation, Julien found himself desirous of seeing her again. He kept thinking of that pretty hand of hers. He went down into the garden, but Madame de Renal kept him waiting for a long time. But if Julien had loved her, he would have seen her forehead glued to the pane behind the half-closed blinds on the first floor. She was looking at him. Finally, in spite of her resolutions, she decided to go into the garden. Her habitual pallor had been succeeded by more lively hues. This woman, simple as she was, was manifestly agitated. A sentiment of constraint and even of anger altered that expression of profound serenity which seemed, as it were, to be above all the vulgar interests of life, and gave so much charm to that divine face. Julian approached her with eagerness, admiring those beautiful arms which were just visible through a hastily donned shawl. The freshness of the morning air seemed to accentuate still more the brilliance of her complexion, which the agitation of the past night rendered all the more susceptible to all impressions. This demure and pathetic beauty, which was, at the same time, full of thoughts which are never found in the inferior classes, seemed to reveal to Julian a faculty in his own soul which he had never before realized. Engrossed in his admiration of the charms on which his greedy gaze was riveted, julian took for granted the friendly welcome which he was expecting to receive he was all the more astonished at the icy coldness which she endeavoured to manifest to him and through which he thought he could even distinguish the intention of putting him in his place the smile of pleasure died away from his lips as he remembered his rank in society especially from the point of view of a rich and noble heiress in a single moment his face exhibited nothing but haughtiness and anger against himself he felt violently disgusted that he could have put off his departure for more than an hour simply to receive so humiliating a welcome it's only a fool he said to himself who is angry with others a stone falls because it is heavy am i going to be a child all my life how on earth is it that i manage to contract the charming habit of showing my real self to those people simply in return for their money if i want to win their respect and that of my own self i must show them that it is simply a business transaction between my poverty and their wealth but that my heart is a thousand leagues away from their insolence and is situated in too high a sphere to be affected by their pretty marks of favour or disdain while these feelings were crowding the soul of the young tutor his mobile features assumed an expression of ferocity and injured pride madame de renal was extremely troubled the virtuous coldness that she had meant to put into her welcome was succeeded by an expression of interest an interest animated by all the surprise brought about by the sudden change which she had just seen the empty morning platitudes about her health and the fineness of the day suddenly dried up Julian's judgment was disturbed by no passion, and he soon found a means of manifesting to Madame de Renal how light was the friendly relationship that he considered existed between them. He said nothing to her about the little journey he was going to make, saluted her, and went away. As she watched him go, she was overwhelmed by the somber haughtiness which she read in that look which had been so gracious the previous evening. Her eldest son ran up from the bottom of the garden and said as he kissed her, We have a holiday. Monsieur Julien is going on a journey. At these words, Madame de Renal felt seized by a deadly coldness. She was unhappy by reason of her virtue, and even more unhappy by reason of her weakness. This new event engrossed her imagination, and she was transported far beyond the good resolutions which she owed to the awful night she had just passed. It was not now a question of resisting that charming lover, but of losing him for ever. It was necessary to appear at breakfast. To complete her anguish, Monsieur de Renal and Madame Derville talked of nothing but Julien's departure. The mayor of Verrieres had noticed something unusual in the firm tone in which he had asked for a holiday 
that little peasant has no doubt got somebody else's offer up his sleeve but that somebody else even though it is monsieur valinard is bound to be a little discouraged by the sum of six hundred francs which the annual salary now tots up to he must have asked yesterday at verrieres for a period of three days to think it over and our little gentleman runs off to the mountains this morning so as not to be obliged to give me an answer think of having to reckon with a wretched workman who puts on airs but that's what we've come to if my husband who does not know how deeply he has wounded julian thinks that he will leave us what can i think myself said madame de renal to herself yes that is all decided in order to be able at any rate to be free to cry and avoid answering madame de Rille's questions she pleaded an awful headache and went to bed that's what women are repeated monsieur de renal there's always something out of order in those complicated machines and he went off jeering while madame de renal was a prey to all the poignancy of the terrible passion in which chance had involved her julian went merrily on his way surrounded by the most beautiful views that mountain scenery can offer he had to cross the great chain north of verger the path which he followed rose gradually among the big beech woods and ran into infinite spirals on the slope of the high mountain which forms the northern boundary of the Drube valley soon the traveller's view as he passed over the lower slopes bounding the course of the Dube towards the south extends as far as the fertile plains of burgundy and beaujolais however insensible was the soul of this ambitious youth to his kind of beauty he could not help stopping from time to time to look at the spectacle at once so vast and so impressive finally he reached the summit of the great mountain near which he had to pass in order to arrive by this cross-country route at the solitary valley where lived his friend fouque the young wood merchant julian was in no hurry to see him either him or any other human being hidden like a bird of prey amid the bare rocks which crowned the great mountain he could see a long way off any one coming near him he discovered a little grotto in the middle of the almost vertical slope of one of the rocks he found a way to it and was soon ensconced in this retreat here he said with eyes brilliant with joy men cannot hurt me it occurred to him to indulge in the pleasure of writing down these thoughts of which were so dangerous to him everywhere else a square stone served him for a desk his pen flew he saw nothing of what was around him he noticed at last that the sun was setting behind the distant mountains of beaujolais why shouldn't i pass the night here he said to himself i have bread and i am free he felt a spiritual exultation at the sound of that great word the necessity of playing the hypocrite resulted in his not being free even at fouque's leaning his head on his two hands julian stayed in the grotto more happy than he had ever been in his life thrilled by his dreams and by the bliss of his freedom without realizing it he saw all the rays of twilight become successively extinguished surrounded by this immense obscurity his soul wandered into the contemplation of what he imagined that he would one day meet in paris first it was a woman much more beautiful and possessed of a much more refined temperament than anything he could have found in the provinces he loved with passion and was loved if he separated from her for some instants it was only to cover himself with glory and to deserve to be loved still more a young man brought up in the environment of the sad truths of paris society would on reaching this point in his romance even if we assume him possessed of julian's imagination have been brought back to himself by the cold irony of the situation great deeds would have disappeared from out his kin together with hope of achieving them and have been succeeded by the platitude if one leaves one's mistress one runs alas the risk of being deceived two or three times a day but the young peasant saw nothing but the lack of opportunity between himself and the most heroic feats but a deep night had succeeded the day and there were still two leagues to walk before he could descend to the cabin in which fouque lived before leaving the little cave julian quite astonished his friend when he knocked at his door at one o'clock in the morning 
he found Fouque engaged in making up his accounts. He was a young man of high stature, rather, rather badly made, with big, hard features, a never-ending nose, and a large fun of good nature concealed beneath his repulsive appearance. "'Have you quarrelled with Monsieur de Renal, then, that you turn up unexpectedly like this?' Julien told him, but in a suitable way, the events of the pre previous day. "'Stay with me,' said Fouquet to him. "'I see that you know Monsieur de Renal, Monsieur Valinard, the sub-prefect, Morgron, the curé Chalon. You have understood the subtleties of the character of these people. So there you are, then, quite qualified to attend auctions. You know arithmetic better than I do. You will keep my accounts.' I make a lot in my business, the impossibility of doing everything myself and the fear of taking a rascal for my partner prevents me daily from undertaking excellent business. It's scarcely a month since I put Monsieur de saint Armand, whom I haven't seen for six years and whom I ran across at the sale at Pontellier in the way of making six thousand francs. Why shouldn't it have been you who made those six thousand francs, or at any rate three thousand, for— if I had had you with me that day, I would have raised the bidding for that, a lot of timber, and everybody else would soon have run away. Be my partner. This offer upset Julian. It spoilt the train of his mad dreams. Fouquet showed his accounts to Julian during the whole of the supper, which the two friends prepared themselves like the Homeric heroes, for Fouquet lived alone, and proved to him all the advantages offered by his timber business. Fouquet had the highest opinion of the gifts and character of Julian. When, finally, the latter was alone in his little room of pine wood, he said to himself, It is true, I can make some thousands of francs here and then take up with advantage the profession of a soldier or a priest according to the fashion then prevalent in France. That little hoard that I shall have amassed will remove all petty difficulties. In the solitude of this mountain, I shall have dissipated to some extent my awful ignorance of so many of the things which make up the life of those men of fashion. But Fouquet has given up all thoughts of marriage, and at the same time keeps telling me that solitude makes him unhappy. It is clear that if he takes a partner who has no capital to put into his business, he does so in the hopes of getting a companion who will never leave him. "'Shall I deceive my friend?' exclaimed Julian petulantly. This being, who found hypocrisy and complete callousness his ordinary means of self-preservation, could not, on this occasion, endure the idea of the slightest lack of delicate feeling towards a man whom he loved. But suddenly Julian was happy. He had a reason for a refusal. What? Shall I be coward enough to waste seven or eight years? I shall get to twenty-eight in that way. But at that age Bonaparte had achieved his greatest feats. When I shall have made in obscurity a little money by frequenting timber sales and earning the good graces of some rascally understrappers who will guarantee that I shall still have the sacred fire with which one makes a name for oneself. The following morning, Julien, with considerable sang -froid, said in answer to the good Fouquet who regarded the manner of the partnership as settled, that his vocation for the holy ministry of the altars would not permit him to accept it. Fouquet did not return to the subject. But just think, he repeated to himself, I'll make you my partner, or if you prefer it, I'll give you four thousand francs a year, and you want to return to that Monsieur de Renal of yours who despises you like the mud on his shoes. When you have got two thousand lou in front of you, what is to prevent you from entering the seminary? I'll go further. I will undertake to procure for you the best living in the district for, added Fouquet, lowering his voice, I supply firewood to Monsieur le Monsieur le Monsieur. I provide them with first quality oak, but they only pay me for plain wood. But never was money better invested. Nothing could conquer Julian's vocation. Fouquet finished by thinking him a little mad. The third day, in the early morning, Julian left his friend and passed the day amongst the rocks with the great mountain. He found his little cave again, but he had no longer peace of mind. His friend's offers had robbed him of it. He found himself not between vice and virtue like Hercules, but between mediocrity coupled with an assured prosperity and all the heroic dreams of his youth. So I have not got real determination after all, he said to himself, and it was his doubt on this score which pained him the most. 
I am not of the staff of which great men are made, because I fear that eight years spent in earning a livelihood will deprive me of that sublime energy which inspires the accomplishment of extraordinary feats. End of chapter 12